actual story. This is real. This is in America, people, um, happening in New York City right now. Apparently, this lady gets arrested for trying to kick out squatters out of her million dollar house. She goes into the house, she changes the locks. Somehow the squatters squeeze back into the house. The squatters call the police on the homeowner and she gets arrested. This is where the country is going. This is, I don't even want to call it blue policy, but are you serious? Are you kidding me right now? This is the country of law and order. I cannot believe it how um, we've gotten here. And then Maddie, we were talking about, there's like a Venezuelan video where they're actually explaining how to do this. This guy has business plan. He's communicating to other people on how to go and squat and find houses. And he's got like seven houses that he's squatting in and he can basically take over. All right, everybody, welcome back to another King's Table episode. I am so bummed I had to miss last week, but the three guys held it together. I am, I'm really, really excited to be back. Uh, clearly, I am energized. We have a lot of really great topics today. The world is really giving us so much, so much good stuff. It's, it's just laying it up for us. So lots of good things coming up. Um, but again, welcome back to the King's Table. I'm Ashish Nathu, the hostess with the mostest, the Sultan of Sofas. I am back. Here we go. Oh, he's owning it. Joined, he's owning the Sultan of Sofas. I am joined by my best friends, of course, Matty Atchison, the hero of hospitality, the dad gang hat stockholder himself. Here he is, the bike Ayala, the sage coming in hot. And of course, the one and only trend spotter, Aaron Amujastegi. Good to see you guys. Lots of fun topics today. I kind of want to just start, and, and it's going to be a little bit random, but let's just kind of get into it. Um, you guys see this thing about this bridge crash that just happened yesterday or the night before, uh, I think it was a night and a half ago, um, in Baltimore where this shipping vessel leaves the port of Baltimore and within a couple of miles runs into this bridge. Really sad story. Uh, it looks like from the information that's coming out that it ran out of power, like a few hundred feet away from this bridge. They signaled Mayday. Unfortunately, there were I don't want to quote wrong information, but like some 20 cars or something like that, or 20 people were on the bridge. And unfortunately they can't find six people. So really sad story. Um, and, uh, just a really interesting situation. Apparently the ship that hit this bridge, if we want to show the video, it's like really scary, I, I, but I, I this, got a video of it. Yeah. Go ahead. Show it. Like it's so, it's so sad, so scary. Um, but this is a really important story, not only because it's an accident, um, but also it is an important port in the United States. And so it's definitely an issue that has the, caused concern for us in our business. But look at this thing, man. You can see like, the lights flickering on and off. It had power, power outages twice. And then I, from this angle, it looks like a small bridge, right? But it's not a small no, bridge. It's not a small bridge. Right. And I saw these different angles where it's a huge bridge and like Cars, the fact that it fell that quickly when I saw it, I was imagining something smaller and then it got to a different angle. And so it's crazy to think of the implications of like shipping and that sort of deal. The other idea of when you're on a bridge, you couldn't feel more safe and for a giant bridge to suddenly collapse, like terrifying oh for the few that it happened to, I can't imagine. But then also, what does that do to the city for a while? You can't just like, how it takes years to build a bridge. So I don't, I, I'm not in Baltimore. I don't know enough about there's so many implications or like there's so many outcomes of people that it's going to affect long term when it comes to shipping, to routing, like it's catastrophic. And then there's the conspiracy theory side that talks about power clicking on and off, right? That's like, is that, could that be like a terrorist type attack? Now, I guess if it was, somebody would have taken ownership of it, but it reminds me of that show we just saw, like the leave the world behind type stuff where all of a sudden like cars are crashing into each other. And, but like in that movie, a, a, a container ship like that, like flies ashore without, you know, without putting on the brakes and things like that is, are the ships that high tech that somebody could actually remotely steer it a different way? Or like, I don't, I don't know anything about actual cargo ships. I'm really surprised that they weren't. Yeah. I'm really surprised how these things can still happen. I've seen Well, I was going to say, I've seen a lot of, 
people that are in kind of the shipping industry talk about how when you enter this channel, they were already, they should have already been turned and that this was either because they're, they're, basically there's a lot of red flags that people negligence. in the industry are saying, whether it's negligence, whether it's a cyber attack and there was something more premeditated here and further looking into, who Crazy. knows? But yeah, wild. I mean, when you think about it, right, I, I was reading this, it just talked to, talks about how this particular channel is a massive channel for shipping hazardous material and shipping other cargo that's really critical and important to the Northeast. And now that port, that channel, yes. that section is going to be down for four to five years. Yeah, this is not a joke. I mean, we have we already have customers calling us about, hey, what does this do to our shipments? Uh, freight forwarders don't know what to do with the shipments that are stuck in the port. You can't get it. Baltimore so is a very change, important transit port into the U.S. Very important. It's not just that the bridge is down. Now boats can't go through there. Yeah. Right. Right. Because they. Uh, so check this. Uh, it says, when you choke off Baltimore, you have cut the main north-south hazardous corridor, which is I-95 in half. So now all of that has to go around the city or go somewhere else. To move some of that cargo through the tunnel system, you're going to have to get a permit, but those are slow to get and require an escort system that is expensive and has to be done right. And then it just kind of goes further and further into how this kind of ripple effect impacts, you know, not only this particular region of the country. So very interesting to think about how this one little thing that many people may not be talking about as being a big thing actually is a big thing when you think about it. Maddie, I mean, basically, we, we talked about this on a few episodes ago about how the Suez Canal is getting all messed up. The Red Sea is is affecting global shipping. And now you shut down Baltimore. You have, you know, the ports in the south. You have Newark now going to get congested. Baltimore is probably a top one or two uh, East Coast United States port. So it's a big issue. This is a big problem for the Dude, U.S. supply I chain. I'm going to go ahead and just say terrorist attack. Like when we look at like the implications of that, like the, there's just no way that sort of thing happens by accident. Like if, I mean, it, I guess, I guess who knows, but like, it just seems too uh, perfect of a crash too. Mm -hmm. where it That's hit like it hit, the, it, it hit the tower it hit like the it hit the vertical correct. piece that holds it up like the bridge could have hit in another spot and probably caused damage but it took out the major support i saw an article about one other location too where it happened previously to a bridge and so now there's all these like concrete cones around but yeah i mean i just pulled up the image if, if you're watching us on youtube that kind of showed what it impacts and where it impacts into the city and for a guy that knows nothing about shipping I'm surprised at how big of an impact it could have on shipping nationwide. But as you say that, you're like, no, if there's a major shipping port in there and now none of the other places are going to have room because everybody was at capacity. Uh, well, deal. and another interesting point is, well, okay, so if this is a major channel that import export happens and logistically is a critical vein of our commerce system, how does that impact inflation? I saw an article come out today talking about how these kinds of incidents, and again, you could talk about whether it's this particular one, whether you talk about, you know, many of the chicken farms that have magically been lit on fire and hundreds of thousands of chickens are getting killed. And now all of a sudden you see Chick-fil-A, the statement that has come out recently with them that they made uh, one of their campaign statements back in the early 2000s was we will never have antibiotic uh, pumped chicken. Well, now they've talked about due to recent supply issues with chicken and chicken farms nationwide, they are now using chicken at mass, but it has to be with some of these antibiotics in them. And so it's interesting, right? When you think about some of these conspiracy theories or some of these just, and let's just not call them conspiracy theories. Let's just say real events that are happening. How do those things tie into inflation and impact everyday Americans? Sometimes people just go, ah, 
just another incident because we're so desensitized to all of the craziness that happens in our world nowadays. But when you think about some of these things, this really impacts everyday Americans in a really big way, not only on the short term, but in the long term. Uh, yeah, we're, we are getting conspiracy theorists. But you know what's interesting about what you're talking about, Maddie, is at what point do coincidences no longer be coincidences, right? Kind of scary. Perception is reality. Doesn't matter that it happened, but the fact that all these things are tied. Yeah, it's I I, I hope we're bloody wrong. That's all I gotta say. I I don't I don't think that there's you know, if we would have been talking about this ten years ago, everybody would say you're crazy, but um and I'm you know, I'm borderline crazy yeah. at times with conspiracy theory, but like I I'm sharing this article right now. Did you guys see this? That public utilities are being hacked by Iranian cyber security, like or cyber attacks. This like, is this crazy. Is not even, they're not even like, it's not even being hidden anymore. Um, and you know, I had a guy on my podcast in 2020. Um, and I actually just had his son on last week and his name, his name was Gene. And he was talking in 2020 about how, um, in his mind, they were putting, they were spreading COVID through the water systems. And when he said that on my podcast, I was like, whoa, hold on a second. Jesus. Like, it just sounded crazy, right? But like, I, I had actually said this for years. Like if I wanted, I shouldn't even say this, but if I wanted to like, if I wanted to like kill a bunch of people or something, like what, what do you do? Like poison the water systems. And it sounds like this crazy thing, but then you see articles like this in Pennsylvania where like Iran is literally cyber attacking our water systems. And then you see things like this ship, which by the way, is a side note, like trying to come off the conspiracy theory for a second, Aaron, you know, this from having a boat, uh, the, the downside to having a boat is like going, going into like a dock. If you don't have power, you can't steer. And so, you know, just eliminating the conspiracy theory for a few minutes. Like, um, I understand why the boat was like, but, all that being said, it just opens your mind up to so many more things. Cause like back to what you're saying, Ash, about, you know, even, even if this wasn't a cyber attack or a security attack or a terrorist attack, just knowing that the impact that this has had now after the fact, you know, I just think about like, what happens if you just attack bridges simultaneously in 10 different cities and cut off the ports, yeah. like the entire country would be down. Done. So it just shows your vulnerability in and whether we think it's, you know, conspiracy theory or not, like we've got to be prepared for this stuff because there will be a day where you need water, um, you need access. I mean, even just during COVID and not being able to get medicine and all well, of that's that, why, like, if there's that's anything why that the last few years have taught us is that we need to get prepared for chaos when chaos happens. Yeah, that's why my... Vivek needs to be our Homeland Security advisor. <laughs> Oh yeah, we'll we get to jump to that in a second. Mike knows I've crashed my boat a couple times, so thank you for telling the world that, Mike. Um, <laughs> oh, but we don't know about uh, that. You should tell us. Tell us exactly what you did. I mean, I mean, Mike's son taught me how to drive the boat, though, so maybe we can pass the. Uh, uh, but it wasn't Tim. The, but maybe we could pass the the stuff around. But Dylan is probably the boat, best boat captain ever. But the um, the article that for those of you guys just listening and not listening just on YouTube, the article that Mike had shared a second ago. I don't know, Mike, if you can pull back up for just a second. It was crazy, but it's, so it's like, I think, I think what it said was it was like a Pennsylvania town had this thing come up on their screen that says you've been hacked. And it was essentially said by Iran and it was something about like Palestine and or here it's coming back up. So I'll be able to read it. It says you've been hacked down with Israel. It's signed by like Iran. Every equipment made in Israel is cyber Avengers legal target hackers targeted Pennsylvania's municipal water authority focusing on a device because the device was made in Israel. It's wild, these things. I mean, so you don't have to go through any more of it. I just wanted the people that were listening and not watching us uh, to see, like, how kind of funny that image is. And if you're watching it on YouTube, like, I would be so baffled if I showed up for work one day or show up to, like, log into your payment system and you see them, uh, you know, taking uh, credit for it. So that is wild stuff to start the podcast today for sure. It scares me how much we can get to conspiracy theory just like that. Dude, it was on accident. I mean, I... So Mike's right. You like if a boat doesn't have power, you can't steer it. But why was it aimed right at the freaking tower? It's anyway. We'll get there. We'll know in a week or two. The God. other thing is really interesting on these ships. 
There's only two human beings on these big ships, man. They go all around the world. There's only two human beings on the entire ship. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, there's a, Dude, there's like a lot the of captain trust and the guy. It. It's like two people. That's it. Like I'm not saying like. There's only two people on that ship. You guys remember years ago, like the pilot that <clears throat> woke up depressed and he locked the other co-pilot out and he and he crashed the plane on purpose. Like the I don't remember. It wasn't that long ago. I just saw like a new video recurring Scary. of it. Like, dude, sing about like that means like one person. If well, a it ship reminds you, that. reminds you, dude. Everything is about people, right? Like you, you have these redundancies of people, maybe two pilots or whatever. You, you know, I don't know if you guys heard this. It was like last week there was a Delta pilot that walked on the plane drunk. And they mm-hmm. somehow caught him before he took off and put him in jail. Like, can you imagine if they didn't catch him? Mm-hmm. Just like the the things about people. Anyways, yeah. uh, sorry to start the, the pod this way, but I just thought it'd be an interesting topic because it is a really critical vein in the United States supply chain. Um, obviously a really sad story. Hopefully we are completely bananas crazy and this was an absolute accident because uh god forbid somebody intentionally did this but uh such a devastating situation and uh it will definitely affect the supply chain and inflation and and how we import things into the u.s and transit and all those kind of things but um let's transition I, i don't know if you guys saw this as well uh let's talk about politics for a minute donald trump let's talk about his truth social situation his um his bail i think maybe some of you guys know more than this more about this than i do but his truth social platform which is a social media platform that he owns 60 percent of went public on tuesday and it's trading about 64 bucks on the nasdaq um kind of interesting it's being traded at about three or four billion dollars and apparently that's increasing his wealth he can't sell out of it but that's what it's trading at right now um yeah so tell us guys why is this important what's going on here and what do you guys think the i mean i think it's kind of i think it's great well great in one sense when he started that like social media face right he had got it was back when the reminder is back when like he got kicked off of twitter kicked out of everything right yeah and then as a result then he got kicked out of everything and he was like fine i'll start my own and so many people and man i tell you what what, me as someone included was like you can't start your own you can't compete with something like that now in fairness i've never lo- i think i probably did log into truth social maybe that week but i haven't gone into even see or really remember that it's still functioning but the concept that someone can have enough i don't know reach that they can start their own thing it's like the way that elon musk does business where if somebody makes him mad he's like okay like that's part of why he took over twitter Right. Part of why they bought Twitter was because of that. So it's it is pretty impressive that someone could start a social media. I'm going to say two years ago. I don't know if I got the time right, but a couple years ago, whenever that happened and then have it go public at a time when, frankly, Trump could use a boost to his net worth with everything that he's battling. So I'm I'm (laughs) impressed. I'm impressed that I haven't logged into it, but there was enough people that have that it's has that big of a market cap. Well, as a as a quick comparison, uh, I saw an article today on a guy comparing true social to reddit which reddit as many people know is another social media platform that just went public last week it went public at an 11 billion market cap wow their their revenue is 804 million dollars a year and they have 73 million active daily users mark um true social trump's market cap was at 9.7 billion, so not far off from the 11 billion of Reddit, but instead of 73 million active daily users, he only has 5 million active daily daily users. And instead of 804 million in revenue, like Reddit has, True Social only has 4.6 million in annual revenue. So very interesting to see that. Why are we shorting that then? That sounds like we should be shorting it. That market cap rate, is pretty inflated if you you know extrapolate out the active monthly users and revenue basis. compared to uh, to Reddit. But man, like you said, couldn't be better timing for him than right now. You know, because uh, the New York appeals court ruled on Monday to reduce his 464 million civil fraud uh, bond down to 175 million. I don't know if. 
uh, Tim can pull up the clip of the gangster clip. Let's see it. I'm so so ready for this. It's so funny. So obviously, as they're teeing this up, people are asking him, (laughs) how does Trump, how does Trump going to pay for this? Right. Because they were talking about a fire sale and they're talking about Miralago getting sold and taking his assets, taking his hotels. Right. And, you know, that's that's a really big deal. And while Tim is, you know, pulling that up, I think it's important to note that how crazy this whole scenario is, whether you like Trump or not. You know, to have the notion of seizing properties owned by a former president of the United States and not only that, but the front runner and a significant threat to the current administration and opposition right now, a front runner of the presidential race right now in 2024, to to be able to go and seize assets, not just of Trump, but belonging to a company that has never missed a payment that has never been in default, that has never breached a covenant on a loan agreement, that has built American skylines, that has repeatedly made banks hundreds of millions of dollars while employing thousands of people throughout New York City or the state of New York. That is that is like mind boggling to me. And to be able to go after somebody in that capacity is so egregiously wrong in my opinion and set such a wrong precedent and globally i mean the whole world is watching what they're doing right now and honestly thankfully in my opinion not because i like trump but because i like what he's fighting against and what he stands for for america that every time they go after this guy and they throw daggers and darts at him he seems to find a way to use that to his advantage to get more and more people to not back him because they like him, but to back him because they're disgusted with what is going on on the other side and who is leading that charge, which is unfortunately representing a lot of the left. And so many people that are on the left don't like that being the representation of who they are, whether they like Trump or not. That's not what democracy in America has stood for. And I think it's biting the left in a really big way. Maddie, I think you're absolutely right that it is... um whether you like him or not, it is obvious that the way that the judge is dealing with that kind of bond situation up there was a political attack. We'll start it over. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. So yeah. freaking funny. Like they're trying to catch him like, well, what's your collateral? Are you actually going to be able to hit your bond? And he just says cash. And somebody so to be clear, he has, has he paid that. this bond yet? He's got 10 days or He's nine days, days now. So they, they negotiated it down. They agreed to a lower bond because it was supposed to essentially be penalizing him every day. And then they were going to seize the assets of a company that was totally working. It was it was a political attack. Uh, yep. And I'm glad that maybe he has some headway and maybe his cash is going to come as a loan against his uh, stock over here. He can't sell his stock yet. He can no. take a loan against it, I bet. He can probably um, collateralize it that way, yeah. You know, I on a total side note, as entrepreneurs... I was having a talk with somebody today that every, it seems like every four or five years, I am absolutely scrambling to pay my bills that on paper, I have a crap ton of money. And in real life, I'm broke. Like if I'm just going to be honest, there's so many times even lately that I'm scrambling and I'm like going to max out this credit card and take a loan from a buddy and I'm going to move money over here. And I'm not worried as I'm doing it, but there's times in business that we have to like do the craziest stuff to survive. And then at the last second, we're like, boom, we did it. And then in two months, I've got this giant project dropping. I'm going to get a giant check from that. And all the mess that I've been doing over the last six months is cleaned up again. And Trump is just doing it on the billion dollar level. Now, maybe you guys don't run your entrepreneur businesses like I do, but I think probably a lot of the listeners that are entrepreneurs, when we talk about this, like I look amazing on paper and there's times when I'm just printing cash and there's times when I'm like borrowing money from a buddy. This is uh, a great point. Great topic. Yeah. I think, I think you're spot on. It's, it's actually crazy because, and I think, it, I think it's extrapolated even more in the day of social media. I was on a call, um, I was on a call last week. I, I won't mention, you know, the group or who, but somebody that I'm sitting here thinking like, just tell us, Mike, let's just no. throw them under the bus. <laughs> I, won't, I won't do it. I won't do it. You know, somebody that I'm thinking from the outside, it looks like they're just crushing it. And, and they're like, man, all my businesses are struggling. We're like, you know, Barely, I'm thinking about closing down four of them and it's, it's, a, 
it's an ongoing, never ending problem. And I think from the outside looking in, you know, sometimes you feel so alone and it doesn't matter if you're making $30,000 a year or $300,000 a year or $3 million a year. Like this is an ongoing problem. So Aaron, I'm, I'm really glad you brought it up because I think in, again, in this day and age of the highlight reel on social media, I think it's really easy to, to just look out and think that everybody else is winning all the time. When in reality, there, there, there is no constant mountaintop experience. And I think we all have to understand that. In fact, I was thinking back to my first business and I remember, you know, having, we, we had this huge client, it was called Barrett Goldstrike. And sometimes like they would, I mean, it'd take them sometimes 160 days to pay us because like literally one approver one time, we had like a $450,000 job. And the guy that was like the approver ended up having to go to surgery and he was out for like four months. And, and it, it was like stuck on him approving it. And they didn't even have any contingency to where, because he issued the purchase order and was the only one that could approve the work, we couldn't get paid. And I remember talking to my controller and I was, she's like, how are we going to make payroll? I've never missed a payroll since 2004, but I will tell you what, sometimes it's like by the skin of my teeth. Mm -hmm. And I think people don't talk about that enough because you're always waiting on money. Projects go bad. Situations happen with business partners. Clients go bankrupt and we just figure it out. But we're just such optimists. Baltimore, Baltimore so, port shuts down. It could never, be anything. Can't get it's like break. one step in front of the other. Like people like maybe Trump doesn't know how he's going to pay the bond yet, but first he had to get the bond reduced. Right. The way my brain works as an entrepreneur is I don't know what's happening next. Die but what's another the, day, man. Die another right? day. You, you buy another day. So he bought a week. Right. And now his, and his first challenge was reduce the bond and buy himself a week. Now that he bought himself a week, his next challenge is do it. And where can you grab it from? It's just a, it's an it's, entrepreneurial. That, it really is though. Right. I mean, I think about like you eat the elephant one bite at a time. You solve big problems one bite at a time. You take down a great opportunity one bite at a time. I mean, I'm looking at this 70,000 square foot retail plaza that I'm in contract on. And, you know, I've been in due diligence on it and everybody keeps asking me, like, how are you going to, how are you going to buy it? How are you going to afford to pay for it? I'm like, I don't know. I'm going to just take it one step at a time. Figure and it out if, it's a, if, it's a great, if it's a great deal, I know that I'm going to find a way to make it happen, but I got to yep. figure out all the other steps first before I start worrying about that. Well, I think that's a big mindset shift for people. I think that's why most people can't do it and is not made for everybody because if you're looking for certainty, this is the wrong game to be in. <laughs> That's the right? truth. You yeah, but, you, but, it, but also if you're looking for certainty and you're working for someone else, there is no certainty. You're, yeah. you're right, Mike, it's but it's mystery. varying degrees of certainty. But if no. you have you know a sickness. I mean, it's at of, least as an entrepreneur, <laughs> That's a I, get to, I get to decide if I'm going to put in the work and get through this shit or not. As an employee, and I'm not, I'm not downplaying W2, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just bringing up that there's no certainty period. And if you're looking for certainty in life, you know, I actually heard this statement one time. If you're looking for security, the best place to find it is prison. Yeah, totally. totally. Or death. One or the other. You're good at, you're <laughs> good no at certainty. tennis and poker. You're good at tennis and poker. I would like to start officially a petition here on this podcast about why <laughs> it's harder for entrepreneurs to get loans than W2 employees. Yes. That's horrible. We have two signatures. Yeah, we have, we're, I'm in. I'm in. The, I don't uh, understand, we'll right? Like when you go to banks, or even if it's a small loan, forget about big loans without any collateral. Why is it that W-2 income has higher value than K-1 income? It just makes no sense to me. It's a great point. It's, yeah, the, here's the unique thing about that for, I mean, I think probably most of our listeners know. But if you are an entrepreneur and you want to get a loan, it's two years of income to get that loan. And, there, and I remember having a couple of entrepreneurs come to me and say, hey, Aaron, can I come work for you for three weeks? Because they will use my first pay stub. They just need a pay stub. It's pathetic. I need a job for a month because it doesn't matter that he's been making $100,000 a year for his own business. He needs a job for a month that actually didn't could be less. I, he needed to get a salary of $6,000 a month in order to get a loan. And he could come work for me for a month and then go get his loan. And it was like, how does that make sense that the, you can, you can be unemployed for two years, get a job and on your first pay stub, get a loan, or you can have a business running for 18 months successfully. But if you don't have two years of tax returns, 
Uh, you can't get the loan. It is a weird. It, those it's fascinating. It's the rules of the game. You got to learn how to play the rules. Play with the rules. But the the rules are stupid sometimes. The they can definitely be stupid. Let's let's pivot to another topic. Maybe I want to get into this real estate conversation because there's a bunch of comments on our YouTube about this from your guys's last week episode. But let me start with this topic, uh, which I thought was really fascinating. Maddie, we were just talking about it before we started recording. Um, there is a New York City woman in the Bronx. I don't know if you guys heard about this. It just happened the last couple of days. But actual story, this is real. This is in America, people, um, happening in New York City right now. Apparently, this lady gets arrested for trying to kick out squatters out of her million-dollar house. So they crazy. came into her house in the Bronx for like six weeks, eight weeks. She finds out. She goes into the house. She changes the locks. Somehow the squatters squeeze back into the house. And there's like a video online. I think it's on X of her trying to kick people out again. The police show up. They call the police on her. The squatters call the police on the homeowner and she gets arrested. And if you watch this video on X, it explains how the police are basically saying technically um, you can't evict them right now. There's a procedure to do it. So we have to arrest you. And so this lady gets handcuffed and taken to the police station as the homeowner of the house. Such an amazing story. This is where, this is where the country is going. This is, you know, I don't even want to call it blue policy, but are you serious? Are you kidding me right now? This is the country of law and order. This is the call country we live in. I cannot believe it how um, we've gotten here. And then, Maddie, we were talking about there's like a Venezuelan video on Twitter or something like that where they're actually explaining how to do this. This guy has a business plan. He's communicating to other people on how to go and squat and find houses. And he's got like seven houses that he's squatting in and he can basically take over. So I'd love Teaching to class. hear more about what this is happening. And if you guys are hearing about this, um, obviously, this is in New York. Not surprised. Unfortunately, I'm not surprised that this is happening, but my goodness. Well, I mean, it, it call it what it is. It, this stuff only happens in blue states with blue policy because it, it ain't happening in red states. I'll tell you that much. I mean, Aaron, how, how do you go through an eviction or deal with squatters in Texas? Yeah. So the, so, and I have experience on both sides. We've had this happen to a flip of ours in Portland, Oregon, and the squatters win and it took months and months and months to evict them. I've had it happen several times in California where we had to pay five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 to get them yep. uh, to move or Same. go through the court systems, even when it was obvious uh, that they were squatters. And in Texas, that's why I don't own houses in California anymore or houses so, in Oregon. So how does in this Texas, make sense? Who's, who's the guy who's in pushing Texas, this? It's so different. It makes no sense. Well, so I'll, I'll do the short story in Texas and tell you where it comes from, at least the mindset of why it starts. In Texas, Please it's different. Someone breaks in in Texas and you call the cops and the cops will open the back door and tell them they are going to have to leave, that it's not their ho house. And they will try to say why it is and all the things. And the cops will just essentially stay there and say, no. Like, you know, this isn't the case. Like, if I have to arrest you, I will, especially when there's kids involved. And it's like, or you're going to lose your kids today. Like, get out. So the cops in Texas Crazy. go, no, you don't have to go through the system. And eviction anyway only takes a few weeks in Texas. What it starts as is it started with the mindset that even went way back to 2009, 2010, the first sets of foreclosures where there were innocent tenants and renters at the time that were paying rent to a landlord. The landlord got foreclosed on and the tenants would be stuck in the house. That, so way back in 2009, 2010, that's when the laws of tenant rights really became huge. And they said, no, tenants can't get evicted quickly anymore. It should be a 90-day notice. And it really started extending and creating this tenant right thing. And so at first it was to protect innocent tenants. And then somewhere around the time, like 2012, 2013, 2014, hedge funds started buying up a lot of houses like I'm guilty. I'm much smaller than them. But like investors started buying them and instead said, hey, you can't live here anymore because we're going to sell it. And then there was all this stuff of investors shouldn't own houses. And then squatters would break in. But then whole towns would come out and be like, no, these women have nowhere to go. They're innocent. Like they should get to stay there for free. And then the whole free rent movement came along of like, no, you should forgive rent. Why should people have to pay rent anyway? And as crazy as that sounds to like a normal entrepreneur person with a job, there are millions of people that believe they should be able to have housing for free. So it does happen to be, it's, it was where the free rent movement was. It was a pro rent, um, anti-landlord kind of uh, 
policy that came out, but started way back in 2009 for, for what I say is good reason. It was valid and fair when the law started, and it has morphed into this craziness of you can own a house but not actually own your house type thing. Mic drop. That's it. Mic drop. <laughs> you know what's interesting? I, so I have some mobile home parks in Nevada, and during COVID, so there was a new judge there, and I don't want to get too in the weeds on this, but in Nevada, manufactured housing has a separate law. So tenant landlord law is 119A, and then manufactured housing law is 119B. So they're regulated under you know different laws, but there was a new judge in Nevada that was enforcing um, laws under 119A, which is completely different than B. And they, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because, you know, if you think about the people that enforce the laws, cops, number one, Mm -hmm. and then judges, number two, what's interesting when we see an article like this, or even think about, you know, different States and what could possibly happen, um, the people that are enforcing these laws, and by the way, I love our legal system, but what's interesting about this is it took like nine months for that judge to really listen to the attorneys, get a, like a feedback from the attorney general. It had to go all the way to the state and it probably wouldn't have taken this long if it wasn't during COVID, but it had to go all the way back to the state in order for this judge to get educated on laws that he probably should have known. But what's interesting about this is like on the ground, and, and I'll give a different side of this too. Right now, there's some cops in the same community that will actually enforce evictions when the law has actually changed because they haven't been educated yet. And as a landlord, mm-hmm. I'm definitely not going to bring it up because it actually benefits me. But what's interesting is like local police departments, sheriff departments, whatever it is, and then all the way up to the judges. Like this is just interpretation of laws. And again, I love our legal system, but, but from the other side of it, you don't even know sometimes when you read an article of what's happened, if that's actually New York law, or if this is just some rogue judge, some, you know, rogue Mm -hmm. police department, it's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting problem. Well, it sounds like you in this specific video, I, and I heard the audio of this yesterday that the police is like, well, technically this is the rule. I don't necessarily agree with it. He didn't say that out loud, but you could hear it in his tone. Like, I'm not the one who made the rules, but I am enforcing the rule. And technically, they're right. So I have to arrest you. And it was like pretty amazing. But you're spot on, Mike. Probably because it was on camera. (laughs) Because we have also had police tell us when you find the really, really good ones, right? That they will say, look, I'm going to try this. If they dig in. It's going to have to go to court and there's nothing we can do, but I'm going to try. Ah. We're going to tr- work. So we're going to try this. We're going to try to say it. like, you're not supposed to be here. Here's why you're trying. We're going to try to essentially scare them into leaving because we know it's wrong. But well, if they go, say TikTok, this, this or this, we're going to be out. So the, yeah. So I mean, maybe cause it's on camera. So I have had, even in the blue States, a couple good police officers say, well, let's try this first and had some luck. Yeah. When the people are educated, it's scary. Mooch, it's scary also that like you, I mean, you go on TikTok, people are being educated about this. Yeah. Right. It's Literally. like people going on TikTok and learning how to cross the borders. Like go right here. Here's the GPS location. Do it this way. It's a little bit of a different challenge now because now they are informed in what they can do to break the law. Pretty crazy. Yeah. Well, it's just emboldening people to do things that ultimately are loopholes but are not the right thing to do. Right. And I, I, I just, it reminds me of like, you know, in certain blue state, cause we don't see a lot of these issues in red states that are really just like red states aren't extreme concert. Like most of them aren't these extreme conservative far right states. They're mostly centrist. When you think about it, like, Okay, centrist That's positions true. for most people, that. for most individuals, whether on the left and you're a centrist or you're on the right and you're a centrist, and whatever party kind of aligns with some of you know the issues that are most important to you. But most people are centrist. Like most people, you talk to most people, they want secure borders. They're not anti-immigration. They're just anti-illegal immigration. 
They want safe and clean cities. They want to make crime crime again. They want to protect people's houses from getting squatted in or businesses from having people walk in and steal a bunch of stuff, knowing that they can just walk right out and nobody's going to do anything. They don't want America to be bankrupt with our negligent spending from bureaucrats that want to line their pockets and fund issues that aren't actually serving and helping the American people, right? Like they don't want a lot of these issues that have become like put on pedestals and are representing each sides of the aisle are really not what are actually aligning most of Americans who fall in this middle, reasonable, common sense based thinking. And so that's where I, I live in a very extreme blue state. And I can tell you that our borders in California are not secure, you know, and that our cities, big cities are not safe and clean anymore, that we have a negligent leadership that has ultimately bankrupted California going from tens of billions of dollars in surplus in a year to tens of billions of dollars in deficit. You know, it's so it's just really interesting to see how policy matters and why I think so many people are getting behind Donald Trump is they're going, man, I don't really like this guy, but his actions and what outcomes I desire are most aligned with me. And this is the dude that I kind of have to get behind. And it's because people are just reasonable with their common sense when a lot of these blue and left policies in states are really becoming so far leaning left that it's really making it hard for people who are centrist and identify as Democrats to actually feel aligned or want to support backing those constituents. You know, and all of you guys listening, remember this in a short six months when all of a sudden Biden can no longer run for office and they try to throw Mr. Gavin Newsom from California on the ballot like the that's my that's still my prediction. I hope everybody yeah, remember remembers that in, in California, California you can steal things and not get arrested. <laughs> I mean literally. <laughs> you can steal things in any store. How split is our podcast? Arrested. We got two people from California on the pod and two people from Texas on the pod. That's like why a, we have to do it's, it's, the like offside in Arizona. Every day. All right. Well, let's let's um, anything else on this topic before we get in. I want to get into the YouTube comments because you guys crushed it last week. Um, can I go there? Go there. You're the boss. All right. Because you guys you guys did such a great job last week. Um, what a great episode. There was a lot of comments on the YouTube, but I want to call out. I want to call out everybody who left comments for sure. Uh, Karch Ballard left a comment, of course. Hello, Austin, Texas real estate. Uh, she always listens and leaves a, a comment. Mad dog 6604, Paige Harris, quantum real estate 916. You guys all have such great comments. Some of us oh, are that's Zach back. from Roseville, California. Zach? Yeah. Yeah. Quantum real estate, right? Yep. That's our buddy. Yeah. So, um, Really, really insightful comments. We're getting great feedback on the YouTube channel, but I wanted to read this comment out. Mooch, Mike, Maddie, I think you guys can all comment to this because it's obviously pointed to you. You guys had the discussion, but um, it's a really great question. This guy named Josh Vick, Josh Vick 805. I'm going to read the comment and then you guys respond. He's a new listener. Josh, thanks for listening, brother. He says, good evening, gents. I'm new to the King's Table podcast. We converted another one. Here we go. The excellent Turner Ogle got me here. Uh, Josh says, on the NAR side of things, what I'm about to type, what I'm about to type may sound like a little disrespectful or offensive, but I have a question that's bugging me after listening to your discussion on NAR last week. I'm not sure I should ask, but either way, here it is. Who do you believe does more work in the real estate transaction? The buying or the listing or buyer's agent, and what brings you to that conclusion? During our during your discussion last week, it sounded like there was a pretty big misconception. Turner and I have done listing and buyer side residential and second home that have seen over 120 million dollars in transactions over the last four years, and I'm not sure the gap that y'all perceived is reality, or maybe we just have a vastly different experience. What conclusion did you come to last week that I may have missed? What is Josh talking about? Is Josh right or wrong? Let's have a good debate. But 
I just want to call out Josh. I appreciate him giving us a controversial question. Maybe it's controversial, maybe it's not, but either way, sharing his opinion, sharing his thoughts. Uh, that's what this podcast is all about. So we want to have, we want to have good quality debate and discussion and doesn't mean we always have to agree with each other. So this is a really great topic. I know this is on everybody's mind in the real estate world. Um, Mikey wants to go. So I'm going to toss it to Mike first and let's just go ring around the Rosie. Go ahead. Okay. I want to say, first off, I tried to get Aaron to call me back since Saturday and go live and actually talk about this, but he's been dodging me. Damn. So, sunshine. All you've said was like, Tia, go, you live, let's go, go live. live right now. Go live oh, right now as we talk actually, about it. Actually, he did say, let's go live right now. He did. All right. My bad. <laughs> So we'll just address it on the King's Table podcast. I was trying Let's to get some extra press for me and Aaron. But, you know, I actually love this question, and I don't think that he's wrong. Um, I, in my opinion, and I was a realtor for a while, um, and I hated every minute of it. So I don't disagree with what he's saying. I actually think that the buyer's agents do a shit ton more work than the seller's agents do. But that's also why if you look at the real estate industry, the more seasoned, successful people are on the seller's side. And they have a whole bunch of buyer's agents. Why? Because that's where all the work happens. So I don't mm -hmm. disagree with what Josh is saying. Um, I, I, I just want to point out, Josh, um, and, and I love that you asked the question because I don't think it's offensive or anything else. It's just discussion. Um, you know, these guys can't offend me no matter how stupid my comment is or isn't um, because we're adults and, and this, is, this is why this podcast is valuable. Um, but that being said, I think your question actually opens up the real problem in, in two different perspectives. Just because somebody is doing more work mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it's the value or the way that it should be being done. So mm. why, do, why do newer agents have to be the ones that represent the buyers? And again, I think, Josh, you're making a great point. You know, taking on a buyer that you have to show, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 houses and they can't make up a decision and then you get to the closing line and it falls apart because you know they went and bought a car it is a lot more work <laughs> but i don't think it's the right work and and the second point that i'll make on it and this is what i wanted to go live with Aaron on so my house is listed right now and we've been talking about this for weeks and i was driving literally and i had this epiphany because my my house is currently listed at a 6% um commission and I started thinking about this and even back to our conversation last week, I don't know why I didn't think about this last week, Aaron, but if I unlist my house right now and then I relist my house in three months or, you know, whatever, um, I could literally drop the price of my house by a hundred thousand dollars right now. <laughs> and, and I yeah. could come out exactly the same. And it's crazy because last week when we were talking about this, I wasn't arguing, but I was kind of like, well, is the is the value of house like are his prices actually going to come down? And I was like, no. But then what I immediately realized and why I called you on Saturday was because I could take my house off the market and I could lower the price of my house in three months. And I could come out in the exact same position that I'm in today by dropping my price by a hundred thousand. Yeah. And so that was epiphany number one for me. So stand corrected from last week. I think prices will come down. Um, and I don't know why it didn't click for me, maybe because I'm an idiot or maybe because sometimes ego gets in the way and I wanted to argue with you. But the second thing on Josh's, um, you know, viewpoint, I think this is a programming issue mm -hmm. and we're just programmed as buyers to think that we have to have representation. And by the way, I probably would want representation in some way, shape or form at the closing table, mm -hmm. maybe legal review, maybe negotiation. As you guys were talking last week, you know, I have a menu of offering. But honestly, I don't want a realtor showing me a house. I want to be left alone. And so I think some of his comment, I think what's going to change in the industry is that, you know, buyers are going to be educated and most of them probably don't want a realtor to show them five houses in a day. And if I can just go schedule an appointment on some new technology that Aaron is going to invent, where I can actually just go, you know, see houses. I kind of don't want a realtor to come with me. And so I think we have to really be thinking just back to jo what Josh is saying, like should realtors be doing the level of work that they're doing right now, representing buyers, because it is a shit ton of work and I don't think it's needed. And the industry is going to completely change through this. So I don't disagree with anything he's saying. It's a lot more work on the buyer side as an agent, but is it going to remain that way? Probably not. 
Yeah. The, uh, if I get to jump in, first thing I was going to say too, it's, it's like, so when somebody is, um, building a house, who makes more money? The guy that's the guy that's swinging the hammer and the nail or the developer, right? The developer makes more money. Who does more work? The guy that's swinging the hammer and the nail. Why does the developer make more money? Because the developer does his work before the job starts, right? He had to get the track record and do the other stuff and get the loans. But when it's actually time to bid, it's easy. And I think it's the same with listing agents and buyer's agents. I think it is much easier to find a buyer client than it is to get a listing. Because to get a listing, you have to convince the seller that you're their person. Hardly ever does somebody call and hire the first agent they meet to list their house. But most of buyers hire the first agent they meet to be their buyer. So it's really about, so, so Josh, you're absolutely right. You know, the, the buyer's agents do more work in the transaction because they care because if the transaction doesn't go through for them, they don't get paid for a listing agent. They're going to get paid on the next buyer. The listing agent doesn't care if you're the buyer or not. They don't care if they save the deal or not. Like the smart ones do, because it's all about like getting transactions done faster. But the listing agent knows they're getting paid no matter what. So, of course, you're going to be doing more work. But they did their work before. Um, And so the uh, and also remember, I love agents. I don't like that the law is the way that it is. But I'm trying to tell people you fight. You have to, like, play within the rules. But Mike is also right. There's a technology we use for all of our rentals right now where I don't have local property managers. I've got hundreds and hundreds of rentals where someone goes to our website and they say they want to show it. It sends them a link. They have to upload a picture of their ID. They have to put their credit card. They have to pay a dollar to do it, to verify their identity and make sure they're not a squatter. And it's going to send them a one-time use code and a time where they can go into the property, type in the one-time use code and go view it themselves. People love it. It's a self-showing technology. It's secure. You make sure everyone's real. Now we've had like some, we've had a couple, one out of a thousand squatter will break in. There's ways around it. But in general, there's a technology where a, where a renter can self-show a property without us looking over their shoulder. Uh, that same technology is going to get moved over to, I, I'm sure Zillow is going to buy that company now. Um, they're going to put it on their their way that, you know, how they can do that. So uh, I think the technology will change. I think it's a programming issue. And it's that, that recommendation of spend more time trying to get the listings uh, than trying to get the buyers. Because it doesn't mean that it's fair. Life isn't fair. Um, but the But listing agents will get paid more than buyer's agents for sure. Maddie. So I'm pulling this up. I saw this the other day and I thought it was interesting. So this uh, this was a real estate agent that basically said, you know, support your realtors. And it's obviously in light of everything that's going on. And the average full-time realtors earnings last year was 31,900 at 40 hours a week. And then she went on to list all the things that listing agents do and all of the things that buyer's agents do. And so I started going through this list a little bit and like what you just said in line with that discussion, technology is going to take this 90, you know, 90 step list of activities and probably cut it 60 to 70% over the next couple of years. And then it's going to come down to what really do we need a human and the human element and expertise for? And then how does that recalibrate in, uh, you know, values around commission based on what that looks like? And so my thought is I'm not definitely not disagreeing with what he's saying. I think that the, you know, the work on the buyer side is way more cumbersome than the work on the listing side. That being said, I think that this is a big part of why we're seeing this recalibration and discussion around commissions is because the value that once was perceived and the activities that are now being required to earn that value is drastically changing. And so just because you're doing a lot of busy work doesn't mean that it's valuable work. Yep. And I think that is the disconnect that a lot of people are having. Well, I'm so busy. I'm working 40 hours a week and I'm just making $39,100 a year on average. Well, then go spend your time on higher value ROI activities that bring more value to your marketplace, bring more value to your customer 
And therefore, you can justify and warrant the value that you're asking for. But what I'm saying is, is you go down this list and I know for me as a buyer, I'm not going to put value on any of these things. Mm. That's I, I don't care about those things anymore. So just because you historically have been doing them forever and think that you have to continue doing them to earn that commission, what I'm telling you is that's no longer important to me. Mm -hmm. What buyers are saying is that's no longer important to me. And I think we're going to see this retracing and this shift of value in terms of what you're going to earn in the industry as a professional based on the fact that technology is coming in and disrupting and displacing a lot of these activities, right? And just a lot of these things in terms of buyer education and these little, you know, things that buyers agents feel like they have to do. Most consumers are going, I don't need you for that anymore. And so that's where I think there is a little bit of a disconnect with this narrative is just because you're busy doing things, just because that's historically been the way they've been done, doesn't mean that that is the way that they're going to continue to be perceived as valuable or even necessary because we're seeing a massive shift with technology, with the industry as a whole, with consumer sentiment, with consumer resources, with education. And so... I think that my quick answer to that is you got to you got to reevaluate where your skill set and your time creates the most value in the industry if that's the same role and capacity you're going to play in. Yeah, I got a just short little plug the quickest way to do that. Maddie is absolutely right. And I have 20 spots left for next year's Real Estate Rockstars there Mastermind go, in Austin, Texas. <laughs> I just I threw you that lob. Just, we just released, that was such a lob. We just released the link for next year's tickets. It's going to sell out in like two weeks. So go find me on Instagram. I we, don't make money on the event, but I promise we change lives. And so if you hear Matt's thing and you're like, well, fuck, how do I, sorry, how do I do that? How do I actually change the dollar? Like we have a whole system built out for that to help people like you. Yeah. I love it agents. Was, it was just interesting, right? I just, I was going through this list and I'm going, man, like totally. sched, schedule a time to meet buyers. Is that valuable? Chat GPT no. can do half those things now. That, it, well, right. Explain what home inspection is. When you, when you look at that list, it's obviously self-serving. I think, I think what's really fun about the yeah. conversation is that capitalism wins. Right. And capitalism so when wins. we talk about capitalism always wins. And so Unfortunately, to all of our real estate uh, agents, our, all our good friends, unfortunately, tides are turning, mm -hmm. times are changing. And so by creating a list of 90 things that you do every single day to try to show value is by definition self-serving. If you're doing 90 things that you have to justify to your customer that these are all the things that I'm doing that provide value, you already missed the point. Yeah. And so- I think, you know, we go back to like 80, 20 rule. If you look at technology for a minute, I mean, we're in the real estate tides turning. Mike, I'll throw it over to you in a second. But, you know, if you look at technology, the last 20 years, the most coveted job that anyone in the world could have was to be a, a software developer, write code. In the last two years, that no longer is the case. It changed mm -hmm. like that. So if you want to keep saying, oh, but I've been coding for 20 years and I have the most experience than anybody else and I write in six different codes. Well, guess what, guys? The market doesn't give a shit. So unfortunately, if we're not pivoting and changing now, it is unfortunate for, you know, I don't know how many agents there are, probably a couple tens of thousands of agents around the country. Um, and I know a lot of like, it is the livelihood of many people, but we have, we have to keep figuring out how we provide value. And if our customer doesn't think we're providing value, then unfortunately we're just not providing value. You know, I think the thing that we have to pay attention to just whether it's capitalism, engineering, realtors, I mean, how long have we been having this conversation? Like since 2012, since the 2015, <laughs> that real estate was going to be changed. It's going to get disrupted. It has to. Yep. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. If you look at, there's always there's always a catalyst event. And this is what I think, this, this is what is I it. think we have to pay. This is the catalyst event for real estate because Aaron and, and Maddie, you guys have been in real estate forever. And this is not a new conversation. We've known for a long time that, I mean, how many times- My very I'm, first deal is a convert. 
conversation. This gives her mission, mm-hmm. right, Mike? This is the permission. Yeah, well, yeah. and if you think about human nature, humans are like water. We take the path of least resistance. The reason why, I mean, even though every consumer, the majority of consumers that have bought a house, if you talk to them, not realtors, people that have bought a house, they've said, man, I can't believe I or sold a house because really the buyer, the buyer doesn't have to pay for it. Um, but if you talk to any seller, they're like, man, I can't believe how much I have to pay and the amount of work. This has been an idea that has been in people's heads. I'm not saying this. Every, like everybody thinks this, like, why do I have to pay that much money? But it's a catalyst event like this that actually brings the thinking to the forefront. And, and I'll give an example. So I was the guy, I actually like going to Best Buy. I actually like going to the grocery store. Me too. Store. It's my favorite. Yeah. Oh, so outraged. And, like I was God. resistant to Amazon until 2020. Like I ordered very little from Amazon, Postmates, Uber Eats. I would just, I'd, I'd drive and I'd go, I'd go get Chick-fil-A. Mm-hmm. But when COVID happened, it accelerated the online marketplace. You saw, I mean, even old people. Old, older people were resistant to apps. I'm not loading an app. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. I'm not going to order my groceries. COVID was a catalyst event that moved buying to online. And it was going to happen eventually, but it's a catalyst event. What's going on right now in the real estate industry is going to happen eventually. This just happens to be the catalyst event. Aaron, I have a question for you really quick. I know we probably want to move on, but I'm curious, you know, just from like from an NAR standpoint, this is probably detrimental because there's a ton of realtors that are going to no longer be realtors and they're not going to be paying their association fees. But really like, I'm, I'm honestly course. curious about this as a broker um, or as a real estate agent that is a good one. And, and here's the preface to my question. Like even just thinking back to sellers, what I wanted to talk to you about on Saturday, and I hope my seller's agent isn't watching this, um, but he hasn't shown my house one time. I hope he is watching this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I hope Come he on, is bro. watching What's it. What's going on? I hope, I hope he is watching well, this. Well, he's, like, never, he's never shown my house. It's going to get cut it's out all of the his buyer's own deal. Agents, it's all the buyer's agents that are showing my house. Mm-hmm. And so I actually think this is going to be really good for the real estate agents that actually get their crap together. Because if he actually wants to sell my house, he needs to now become a buyer's agent too. Now, I know, I actually don't think it's going to change the amount of houses that transact. And so, you know, as, as a brokerage, as Keller Williams or whatever, I mean, I, I, houses are still going to transact. They're going to get less commission because it's both sides. So I guess to sum up my question, I know it's going to affect agents and brokerages because the commissions just potentially got cut in half. Um, but I, this is really going to affect NAR, right? Because they're membership dues. Yeah. NAR is going to have to pivot because there, there is actually one of the first questions was people said, well, why would we list on MLS? What's going on mm. in the boardroom of NAR right now? Mitch? Yeah. So the man, they're saying we should not have gotten so greedy back in 2020. Back in 2020, they didn't like uh, wholesalers. And these one guys came up with, uh, I think I talked about this. It's like pocketlisting.com. And so like the really big listing agents out in LA were like, hey, we want to have pocket listings. We don't want people to come with buyer's agents. We want to have a way to market it. Like you're selling a $15 million house. Like those people don't need a buyer's agent, right? So why would you pay $450,000 in buyer agent commission? At the time, NAR said, let's make that illegal. If you're a realtor, you can't do that. If you're a realtor, you're given a listing. It has to go on MLS within three days or you lose your realtor status or you get fined. So it, became, it started to become then a disadvantage to be a realtor. If you're a licensed agent, you could still have pocket listings. But if you had the realtor designation, you could not. Uh, the National Association of Realtors is going to have to pivot. Most of their money was based on acquiring MLS providers, requiring people put stuff in the MLS. But now it's actually going to be an advantage for people to list on Zillow themselves. You know, on MLS, you won't be able to say, uh, we'll pay a 2% buyer's agent commission. But on Zillow, if you have Zillow premium, you could put in the comments, we're paying a 2% buyer's agent commission uh, if you want to come and, and using like credits and things like that. So Zillow will get more listings, but Zillow won't get the leads. But back in the boardroom at NAR, yeah, they're, they're saying like, okay, um, what do we do? Because I think being a realtor now has a disadvantage. You don't need to use the MLS to list stuff anymore because buyers are going to find this stuff on Zillow. 
Um, I think what they should be doing is going all in on at the benefits of legal representation, maybe finding ways to have a lower cost transaction coordination, maybe creating technology to help with transaction coordination or technology to help with like, you know, adding stuff for the buyers. Because that used to be one of their offerings, but then I heard recently people would call the NAR legal hotline and not get answered. But, but in California, it used to be a thing. We used to call the hotline all the time for transactions and they would help us. So there's other offerings to be a realtor. They're going to have to expand on their stuff because they were relying heavily on um, requiring MLS and now people don't have to put stuff on MLS. But it's it's definitely going to hurt their business for sure. Uh, but to be because, clear, the NAR is not a privately held company. It's an association like what's the government, what's the makeup of the. Oh man, I'm not going to answer that right. Matt, do you know? I don't. Yeah, I really don't. Cause I think the, it's fascinating. It, it, it collects it, dues. It has a big budget, but yeah. So like I'll figure their it out. competition is Zillow is homes.com is these other listing agent companies, right? That's their, do they have competition per se? Yeah. So national association of realtors, American trade or association for those who work in the real estate industry has one and a half members or one and a half so million members. Sounds the, like a union. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I, I, I mean, to, to me, I, I think it, if I was confident, uh, what was the guy who left the comment? In, uh, Mr. You know, on the YouTube, you mean? Yeah. If, if <laughs> I, Mr. If, Josh Vick. If I was Josh and I, and I, and I was confident in how much work and value I bring People like Josh are, are going to be great because they're the people who are leaning into these kind of discussions. They're retooling their business plan. They're retooling their systems, they're retooling their teams, and they're retooling their strategies on how they can bring the most value and still either keep and or take market share as a result of this shift. I personally think if I were an agent, a high producing agent at that, um, and this was going on in the industry while I was like still good. in it, I would be ecstatic right now. I would be ecstatic right totally. now. What I would be looking at is what is my value proposition as a listing agent? And what is my value proposition as a buyer's agent? And then I would go down and I would list out all of the things that aren't those ridiculous 90 you know, comments of a little 10 second to do, but like real value and create a real value proposition that makes it a no brainer for people to want to work for me. And I would lean in on that because that's what people are not doing right now. They're so worried about and focused and crying about what is going on with NAR versus going on the offensive and just pivoting and adapting to the new rules of the game and recalibrating their strategy, their business plan, their team, and what actions they're going to take going forward. So I hear and understand the concerns and the frustration and the anger that a lot of people have right now, but I can almost guarantee that 90% of those people in that category will not be making more than $39,100 under this new umbrella as well. So quit the complaining, get back to focusing on what you can control, learning what the new rules of the game are, and go out and play them to the best of your ability. But I was reading. I, I did a little presentation at uh, Tim Rhodes' house this last weekend, which is one of the founders of GoBundance, one of our good friends. And I did a presentation called Winning the Wealth Building Game. And as I was doing a lot of research and kind of compiling a bunch of stuff from my podcast over the years and just things that I've learned, I started thinking and came up with this slide on the laws of the wealth building game. And one of the laws that people need to understand and embrace is that when change and like Mike said, catalysts like this happen, it's the law of adaptability. It was the investors that were like, I got big ass real estate portfolios right now. My tenants aren't paying me. Instead of complaining about COVID and my tenants aren't paying me and what the heck, why are they doing this to me? It was all the people that were going, how do I adapt and pivot and figure out what the rules are in this short-term window because of this catalyst and how do I navigate to still win, right? Same thing goes on with NAR. Same thing's gonna go on with AI in certain businesses and industries. It's the people that are looking at these disruptions and opportunities as a way to adapt and pivot to win big that are ultimately gonna end up winning big versus the people that are so focused on complaining about what was and what it should be that are gonna end up losing. 
it's it, it's interesting. I'm glad that Mike had. I'm sorry I let Mike down and I didn't take his call on Saturday for Instagram Live. So next time, but, we had so many other good comments too on the on the YouTubes. I know you I know you called him out, but the I love hearing about people saying, "Hey, the challenges that we talked when Paige Harris said they're going through building a business right now, mm-hmm. and that we talked about where they're going through on on a smaller scale. Like that's why we do this. I love that Zach uh, Zach Bacon out in California, Quantum Real Estate. He's torn on it. He doesn't agree with us. The and I love that he shared it. He goes back and forth. He goes, I don't think he says he doesn't think the business is going to change. Um, you know, Zach, I hope you're right. I don't think you are. We'll figure it out. Like uh, on the coin toss, as long as you're preparing and informing yourself like this, you're not going to get caught, you know, with your head in the sand. Um, and then some of what we talked about last week was like not waiting for rates to go down, not waiting for the change, like whatever mm-hmm. is the new normal, like today is the new normal. So like, let's get into business and uh, make adjustments and maybe stuff is going to get better. So thank you everybody, you know, Karch Bullard, uh, you know, Debbie and Austin, um, you know, the, Oh, somebody asked about the app. They said, Mike, what was the app you discussed? Trello. It's T R E L L O F F R E. Oh, F R E L O. Oh yeah. That was the, that was the question. They said Frello. Can you link to it? So they got the name, right? Respond right now, Mooch to that right there in the uh, comment. Right. Frello is <laughs> right. Frello. But, but it's, have- not li- it's not live yet. So that's why they can't find it. Oh, not live yet. Boom. That's going to be why. But it will be. Um, all right. Well, I, want to, I want to talk about this other thing. I don't know if you guys saw this. Um, it kind of goes into changing of the tides. I'm, I'm really, I'm in this season in the company right now. I'm using a lot of different analogies, but like I'm, I'm afraid of bureaucratic tendencies. You know, you achieve, you achieve, you achieve a certain amount of scale. You have a certain amount of employees. You can see governmental bureaucratic tendencies come into a company. And so over the last four, five, six weeks, we're starting to really observe these things and start to, and it's definitely a cultural issue, which is why I asked like who owns the NAR, like who's really running this? Is it, is it, are they driven by competition and capitalism? Or are they driven by bureaucratic, um, tendencies of being stale. Like we've always done it this way, which is why we do it. Right. Those kinds of tendencies. Um, there's a clip, which I actually will put into the notes of this. There's a clip between John Stewart and the deputy defense department. I don't know if you guys saw this. It was a couple of years ago where John Stewart interviews the number two person at the deputy of, of defense. And I'm using it right now within the company to show the dynamic between a simple curious question and a bureaucrat who answers and responds and the similarities on how that's showing up within the company, but more specifically culturally, cause I do think this is a cultural problem. It's a mindset problem is, you know, how do you bring in people or how do you stimulate new energy into a company and have them not just fight with bureaucracy and like, cause you want that new energy, new ideas, new blood to come into a company. Let's say, you know, d- different season of people, new generations of people, but then they're, they're fret with all this, like, this is how we do it. This is how we've always done it. You don't know what you're talking about. I don't know if you guys saw this the other day, Ronna McDaniel was hired at NBC news. And then like within three days, she was fired. Boom. Now, I don't, what, I don't really have happened? an opinion. Yeah. So I don't what, really have an opinion about Ronna McDonald. I don't know. She was the RNC chair for many years. Um, in the last couple of months, she got fired, I think in November. Anyways, NBC News, which is a blue leaning, liberal leaning network, hired Ronda McDaniel. Okay. And like yeah. within three days, all of the anchors went online or went on the news and is like trashing the network of like, how did they do this? How could they let this person on? And within four days, the network fired her. So the question I want to ask, or I'm, I'm posing, because I don't really have an opinion about the dynamic that's happening here in terms of the people. But I'm curious in terms of the precedent or the cultural dynamics that exist here when company leaders or business leaders are trying or or cultural leaders are trying to build a company of resiliency, a company or, or, or networks where you're really challenging the status quo. You're trying to figure out what we should improve. What can we do better? You have to bring in people that have different perspectives. And you have to get comfortable with being challenged. And this network, why are you giggling? <laughs> what? Well, you're going you're gonna to get us into a lawsuit if I answer your question. Tell me, what's, yeah. what, what is this about? And, and how, 
How should we be thinking about this as business leaders? Do we just hire people that agree with us all the time? <laughs> what's the what's the skinny here? You can't discriminate based on race, political views, <laughs> um, any of that. So I no comment. <laughs> All right, you now that you got that out of the way, you now give us your real, real if, answer. If you, if you were talking about someone else you know, what do you think they would say? You know, so I think I think I'd say values. screw it. No. <laughs> I like the way you're framing that. <laughs> Not you, but someone hypothetically in the with the same question that was a business owner. How would they answer? You know, I, I think I think as business owners, especially small business owners, a lot of times we get this idea in our head that value statements are something to hang on a wall so that your customers can see it so that it's like a marketing thing. When in reality, um, you know, and I'm a huge fan of traction and EOS, but a big part of that is like really focusing on your core values. And so mm -hmm. I think you can get really clear on what your core values are and make sure you hire accordingly. And that's going to weed out. So again, we can't discriminate based on, you know, political beliefs and, um, you know, sex and race and religion and all of these things. But we can hire based on core values. And so I would say, you know, I, Ash, I, you know, looking at your current issue or any issue that we find ourselves in, it's like, you've got your current challenge with existing employees and things that well, are going I'm on. I'm squashing him, Mike. I'm just to be clear. I'm like, I have zero room for this shit. Yeah. I, yeah, I will well, resign before I let it become bureaucratic. So it's been fun to have the engagement and people to respond. But then you see this, it's like, oh my God, it just, well, more and, and just to, you know, for the audience and for us, maybe a practical, no bureaucracy, that might actually be one of your core values. Like, you know, EOS teaches this over and over and over um, when you're going through, you know, quarterly pulsing or anything else. Th there's a statement that says in an L10 meeting, anything said more than once is politicking. Because if we've made a statement about what we believe, and then we just keep arguing for it, it's politicking. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, maybe I'm not saying that this is the case, but maybe in your organization, no bureaucracy is actually a core value. And what does that mean to you? You know, we're not arguing just to argue or because of our beliefs, like this is what the organization believes. This is what the organization stands for. And if you can't, if you can't align with that, then maybe you need to move on. Maybe it's not actually a fit. And I'm, you know, I think that's the power of core values mm -hmm. and getting those really aligned up front. And I think the other thing with core values too, is they can change because maybe your core values haven't changed. Maybe your business core values haven't changed, but maybe you've hired three or four or 10 people that don't align with your core values. And that's the problem that you're really experiencing right now. And, tr you know, ask me how I know this. <laughs> how do you know this, Mike? Yeah, it's just from experience. Right. And so I think really this is, this is not a value statement that we hang on the wall because it's a shiny sign that we want our customers to see when they walk in the door, it's truly our North star as an organization. And obviously you may very, be very clear on what your organizational core values are. And you just have a group of people that are not aligned with them, but we have to be really careful about <laughs> how, how we, re you know, cause again, we can't discriminate, but you can, you can absolutely hire based on your core values. What I would add to that, if we're all here at the, um, the core values, I think helps hire or fire based on it. The, some of ours is like make profitable decisions. So if someone decides to not do, so if someone like, you know, Oh, I went that way because of this, or I went that way because of that, we could easily say, was that profitable or not? Uh, one of our core values is there are very few true emergencies, right? Like the, you know, and it could be, it could, it, you could have a core value that says we don't let stuff that happens outside the workplace affect us inside the workplace. Um, it's interesting because I think that, um, man, the world just continues to change because I am older than a lot of the people that I'm going to hire and my beliefs are going to be different. And I do, I have had to let people go that I thought were good at stuff because I also knew that they were making other, they were affecting other people's jobs in a negative way. I mean, you could have two all-stars that don't get along and you have to either separate them or let one of them go. Or if you yeah. have somebody that becomes a sour apple, like, no, the way that they do their stuff. If you have one person that's showing up late every day, you have to, you have to get rid of them before everybody starts showing up late every day. Like, so there's lots of different things that impact this, but no, I mean, I think that it's really easy to squash. I think it's crazy that, um, 
that people that essentially the network had to do something, but the network had to make a choice. Essentially, if it was other anchors from the company, they were pretty much saying it's them or us. Uh, in their belief, they were de- the, the network was devaluing themselves. Yeah. They were saying like, no, our values, it could be our values are blue. It could be they're like, no, we've been in, we've been, you know, uh, people that did the news for 15 years. That's why we're anchors. You can't make a newbie that was somebody else have the same position. Whatever it was, they were saying, you're devaluing us. And if you don't do something, we're going to leave. And they might not have said it like that. But then, the, but then the capitalism gets to make a choice. Will we make more money if we keep the new person or if we keep the old person? If one of the people would have risen up and said, hey, you're devaluing my business, then the company could have said, okay, you can leave. But when 90% of the company, it's, it's like when all the employees say like, no, we want to work remote instead. Like some people, Elon's like, cool, come get your last paycheck. You know, I think, like, what, e- I, I think that the lesson for me also is like, you know, what's my role in this problem is that it's definitely, it, this is a leadership issue, right? Is that the leaders allowed this to happen. So where was the lap, last of the judgment? Did you not do enough values? Just, did you not ask the other anchors? Did you not have team meetings about it? How did you make this miscalculation and then let it blow up in your face to potentially devalue your company? And then, you know, I can't even imagine running a company with this much publicity all the time. Like every decision that you're doing is out in the public, but it goes back to leadership. Like you hire the wrong person and then you let them pollute the company. Like Mike was talking about, it's a leadership issue. So from the perspective of what could we do better. I think that's the lesson that I'm taking away from this. The other thing that I think about that's important, I echo everything that Mike and Aaron said. I think my perspective is I love oppositional insights because it either totally enlightens me to something, a viewpoint, a strategy, a way of executing or doing something that my brain just may not think about or see based on my own experiences and my own views. I think the foundation of values is important, but not necessarily always the deciding factor. I think what it comes down to is how is conflict and differences handled within a team environment? Because there have been many world class teams and I'll just use the analogy of sports that had two superstars on it that did not like each other. They Mm. had different values, but they did share in a common mission and goal. They did have some way of working through conflict in a healthy and a respectful manner, or there was something that allowed them to still find alignment on a common goal. And that allowed for them to continue to move forward. And the team still found a way to exceed and excel in a manner that everybody won. So I don't know if I have the answer for that, but it's just making me think around there's got to be a way to still have healthy companies and healthy teams that are completely littered with people who think and act differently. Yeah. And you look at some of the largest corporations in the world, you better guarantee that there's people on the far left and the far right and right in the middle, but they still find a way to produce, to be productive, to be profitable, and to ultimately move the needle forward on a common goal. So how do you get there? I don't necessarily have the specific prescription based on everybody's examples and scenarios and situations being different. But that being said, I do think a critical component of highly performing teams is not that they're all in agreement, but they're aligned. And alignment usually comes through having spaces and frameworks that create healthy dialogue when there's conflict. Yeah, I think my last thought is it's a shame. You know, what you just brought up, Maddie, is it's like healthy conflict is good. No one would listen to us if we agreed with everything. There are some topics that we agree with just because reason rises to the top, but there's plenty that we disagree on and it makes it more fun and it makes for better things and we come back on it. And it's really unfortunate that a news place can't say like, well, why don't we have someone from the red and someone from yeah. the blue debate topics healthily because it makes for better everything. And it totally. goes like, no, we have no interest in having a healthy debate. We want it to just be our way. 
it's a shame for the listeners. It's a shame for the network. And it's well, a shame for the people that said that they weren't going to stand up for it. One of the things I'm learning is that it, you have to teach people how to do this. You have to like almost set, like you have to role play. Okay. How do we disagree on something? How, what would you say? What's an appropriate way to have a, a dispute? How do you, how do you disagree with something without, without triggering them? <laughs> I mean, right? Right here, my, my answer to that is we need to elevate emotional intelligence within You're individuals. Right. You're right. Because that's ultimately what it comes down to, right? Is having emotional awareness that you and I can be totally different, different experiences, different upbringings, different programming. And yet we can still find a way to work through those differences by being emotionally aware enough that those things can be true. And we can also find some common ground to work on together. Yeah. Like you say all the time, Maddie, right? Both things can be true. Yeah. I'm so fun. I'm I'm still wondering if Mikey. Ash is the issue because he thinks he had the idea for King's Table. <laughs> I'm just wondering. Say, I thought there Ash, I, there's some common denominators here. <laughs> did, didn't Ash didn't Ash have the idea? He sends me that text weekly. I, sent, says, yeah, I remind yeah. the, all the listeners that this was all my idea. I don't know why Mike <laughs> still takes credit for it. Okay. Huh? We're gonna put. We gotta find that. We gotta find I'll the screenshots on name. YouTube the one of these the days. The name is his. His was his. Okay. Idea, the the sure. name was was Mikey's. I was gonna call it Aaron's World, but nobody wanted to get behind that one. <laughs> 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 we are always living in Aaron's world. Any other topics you guys want to riff on today? Um, I I think we should quickly save. Um, you know, our boy Vivek is the. You know, it, it's it's newsworthy of what we had going on. Like, uh, you know. Trump did oh, say he's not Vivek. going to have Vivek be the vice, but he will. But he is considering him for a cabinet position. And the article, I think, as it came out, said, uh, for, uh, which one was it for Homeland Security? Yeah, Homeland Security. Yeah. So that was sad and good news all at the same time. I thought like it's because he's, we've been such a fan of his on here and he was the only presidential candidate that was willing to talk to us yet. I think he deserves a little bit of extra news when his stuff comes out. I was I was personally saddened by this. I like I'm glad that he's getting a consolation prize, and maybe that's the maybe that's the path that someone in politics like him needs to go. Um, but the but I'd hate to have a cabinet position just be forgotten when he should be able to run in four or eight years. Well, I still think it's 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 good that he's he went from nobody to being on the cabinet of the U.S. government. If if he gets elected, pretty impressive. Maybe he's two cycles away from having the opportunity to run again as be president. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm well, biased because with, with Indian. Ships, so with ships hitting bridges and uh, you know people hacking uh, water systems, it might be the worst time ever to be the homeland security director. Too maybe that's why. We, maybe that's where he's going to add the most value. He's just going to freaking be ruthless and get us all straight. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think I, we have a bunch of other news in there, but we've been chatting for a while. I think we should re-ask the listeners to give us some topics. For those of you guys yeah, that are still listening it. an hour and 30 or an hour and 40 minutes in, like we freaking love you. We appreciate you. The fact that you guys are willing to listen to us chat and willing to comment like we are your biggest fans. I promise you every time I meet any one of you, I get tears in my eyes and anybody that came out to see me in Austin, they know that I'm telling the truth with that. So if there are news and topics out there that we're not hitting yet or you see a new like when we see news hit, we shoot them over to each other. We send him, we have a group chat. We have a group chat on Instagram and we're saying, saying, Hey, you guys should do this. Hey, you guys, should. if you guys see an article, like, and some of you guys do it, send, send it, it over in. to us, send it yeah. over to any one of us on Instagram. Go, Hey, would love your guys' opinion on this. Would love your guys' opinion on this. Yep. We want to talk about that stuff. Um, we don't just want it to be things that we're finding. So if there's something that we're missing out there and you guys want to hear it, we are in this for you. So send it out. There it is. Leave us comments. Maybe next episode, we will just process issues in the comments. So give yeah, us a bunch of topics. Give us a bunch of questions. Um, another great episode of the King's Table. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Remember, you leave our, leave us a comment on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you share. The cost of listening to us is that you must share it with somebody who may get value from it. Make sure you also go to Spotify and Apple and subscribe there. Leave comments, all those good stuff. Um, whatever. you know, You know what to do. Love you guys. Thanks so much for listening. On behalf of me, Ashish Nathu, Aaron Amuchastegi, Maddie Aitchison, and of course, Mike Ayala. Thanks so much for listening to the King's Table Podcast. Peace. Peace. See you guys next week.